Believe it or not, studying rock mixing made my ambient mixes better. Now, what the heck do rock music and ambient music have in common? I hear you ask. Well, not a lot, but a lot of rock mixing techniques can be easily adapted to ambient music. The four I've squeezed into this video are just a sample of everything I've learned. Six years ago, I decided to take a mixing course. Before then, I'd just been kind of working things out myself, piecing things together from YouTube and a lot of trial and error. I chose Graham Cochran's Mixing University because it was highly regarded and I think I got it on sale on Black Friday. What I hadn't thought about when I bought the course was what kind of music they'd be using in the examples, which turned out to almost be entirely variations on rock music. But I'm glad I took the course, even though a lot of the principles didn't apply to the kind of music that I was making. A lot of the foundational concepts that I learned in the course were genre independent. And with a bit of lateral thinking and some tweaking, I was able to apply them to my music. In this video, I've compiled four examples of rock mixing concepts and how I adapted them to experimental music. But before we get into them, please don't forget to check the links in the description for this video. There's a link to a page full of free resources that are tailored to help ambient and experimental artists mix, master, and release their music, as well as a link to request a free master sample from me. Okay, on to number one. Number one, balancing volumes before processing. This is a fundamental teaching in any mixing course that you should balance the volumes of all of the tracks in your song before you do any processing. Rock mixing usually uses the kick as the anchor instrument and all of the other instruments are balanced around the volume of that kick, which of course is no use in ambient. But what this did teach me was to prioritize getting the relative volumes of the tracks right first. Once I have the volumes locked down, it makes it easier for me to make EQ and compression choices because the volume is one less variable that I have to worry about. I simply make sure to compensate for any changes in the volume of the processing as I mix. Number two, top-down mixing. Top-down mixing is a technique that involves doing the mix bus processing before you process the individual tracks. So for example, if you have three or four synths that are grouped together, you would add your processing to the group to get the overall sound that fits in the mix and then tweaking the individual tracks within that group if they need to be further differentiated or blended together. With care, this can also be used on the whole mix. For example, if I want to make a track sound lo-fi, I'll add a low-pass filter on the mix bus before I process any of the instruments. And then I can effectively mix into that low-pass filter to make sure everything sounds good. If I did that the other way around, putting the filter on after processing the tracks, it would just come across sounding muffled. Number three, vocal harmony panning. Okay, bear with me here. How does vocal harmony panning have anything to do with music that is largely instrumental? Hear me out. I think this one might come from Bobby Arzinski. The basic idea is that the best way to mix harmony vocals against the lead vocal is to put the lead vocal in the center and then pan each harmony further away from the lead vocal according to its pitch. So for example, if you have two harmonies that are a fifth and a seventh higher than the lead vocal, the seventh vocal gets panned the furthest out and the fifth vocal goes somewhere between the seventh vocal and the lead vocal. This works perfectly for most instruments, synths, guitars, whatever you have that is tonal. If you put the lowest pitch instruments towards the center and increase the pan outwards for the higher pitched instruments, you get great separation and don't have to do as much EQ slotting to get everything to sit nicely together. Number four, mono instruments. Rock mixing involves a lot of panning to help all the instruments fit together, as well as to put everything in a space that makes sense to the listener, as if you are watching the band play live. Because these instruments are in mono, you'll often hear a guitar in one side, but not the other. If you listen to some old 60s records like the Beatles, you'll find that the bass and the drums might only be heard in one channel with the guitar and the vocals in the other. Because of this, rock mixes are almost always perfectly mono compatible. Even doubled vocals are recorded in two takes to make sure that they're not exactly the same as each other, which reduces the chances there'll be any phase cancellation. This taught me to focus on recording as many instruments in mono as possible. If something is in stereo in my mixes, it's usually because I've recorded it twice, usually with slightly different settings to avoid them sounding exactly the same. This does take more effort, but it makes for far more interesting mixes as nothing is perfectly the same across the stereo field and it does wonders for the phase profile. So I hope this makes a convincing case that there is a lot to learn from other genres of music. A lot of the techniques I use in my mixes come from many other styles of music. I haven't even touched on what I've learned from genres of music such as vaporwave or techno. If this is the kind of thing you'd like to see more of, 
let me know in the comments and I'll turn it into a series. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel to support it. I absolutely love making these videos for you and your support will make sure that I will continue to be able to do that. Please don't forget to check the links in my description to access all the free stuff. And over here, you'll find a playlist of all my content on producing ambient and experimental music. And until next time, keep making music. Cheers.